everyone. Welcome back to True Crime Buzz. I'm your host, Amber, and with me, as always, is Brittany. Hello. That's right. I'm back. She's back. Back from vacay. She's back. But I'm glad to be back because I missed you so much. Yes, I missed you too. It was weird going from having you in person for a girl's weekend and then a week later, now I'm on vacay away from you and not recording. It was weird. And I'm, you know, it's weird to just not record in person together. That was the best. It was the best. It was really the best. Yes. The sound quality wasn't great because we were in this giant cabin with no soundproofing. The most soundproofing we had was just a quilt over us because we made a little tent fort to record. It was, okay, it was over a luggage rack and one of those privacy partitions that only had two panels. We did the best we could, people. We did. We really (laughs) did. And you know what? It was worth it sound quality or not, just to be able to see you in person, let alone record in person. Yes. Worth it. The dream. All right. What you drinking today? <laughs> what do you think I'm drinking? I'm drinking a Diet Sam's Cold. <gasps> Shit. I forgot. I have a whole case of Bush Light Apple. <gasps> and I for- I meant to put one in the fridge for tonight. Oh, so you don't have I a cold one. I it. No. And I'm not drinking hot beer. That's gross. No, that's a crime. Absolutely <sighs> not. That's devastating. My brother had us get him like six cases because it's really like there's only certain places it's available. And one of those is Virginia. I'm like real close to Virginia. So I guess they sell at our grocery store. And I told him he had us get him like six or eight cases of it. So did you really get him six cases? Yeah. I mean, he paid us back for it. But yeah, I know. But come on. And so Matt got a case for us as well. And I'm like, yes. And I meant to. But oh, well, sober time over here for Brittany. Well. I'll be sober with you because mm. I'm drinking Diet Coke. Yes, bitch. Yes. Yeah. So we're we're Diet Soda twinsies. <laughs> I would love some wine. I have plenty of it, but I just ate dinner and I'm really full. And I just, the thought of any alcohol on top of all the food I just ate for dinner, I just can't. That's okay. But weekend is coming soon and give me about 24 hours. That bottle will be open. That's right. Do you have any true crimes this week? I do. You know what? I'm not even ever going to ask you that again. I should just say, what was your personal true crime this week? Because you always have one. Look, this is not a true crime of my kids. I'm living in an alternate universe because ever since I came back from our girls trip, my kids have been fantastic. Nobody's woken me up. They've gotten along. There's been minimal fighting. It's been fantastic. It's not my kids. What it is, though, is my mom. And I'm going to tell you about- Your mom. I was going to say your husband. (laughs) Okay. So my poor mom has a condition that makes her just very cold. She has circulation issues and she stays very cold. So when she came to visit us the week before our girls trip, she was like, I'm so cold. And she messed with the thermostat. And Matt and I, you don't mess with our thermostat. Like we were not happy. So Matt came in. And we have ceiling vents. And so he closed the vent, you know, in the ceiling. And he's like, I'll open it back up before you record. But then you and I recorded on our trip and stuff. And we forgot to turn it back on. So I walked into this room. And it's a balmy 9,000 degrees in here. Oh, dear. And I've opened it back up. And I've turned down the air. I don't know what I'm doing. Open some windows. Get some air circulating. We'd hear all the animals. We'd hear all the animals. But my husband's playing his Dungeons and Dragons, so I'm just going to have to sit here in this sauna that is my office slash spare bedroom. That is a fucking true crime. Is that why you're naked right now? I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) She's wearing a t-shirt from I'm wearing my Free Britney t-shirt. Yes. Yes. Well, what's your true crime of the week? Do you have any? I do have a true crime and it's all your fault. (gasps) It's all my fault? Yes. You were a really good friend and got me some cookie butter. (laughs) And it is so good that I literally, if I open it with a spoon, I can't just take one little scoop out. No, I sit and eat half the jar and then all of a sudden I have this horrible tummy ache. It should be a true crime how delicious that stuff is. I mean, facts, because I also can't just have a spoonful. I have to hide it from myself. And because I have memory issues, like, I'll forget where I hid it. That's what I have to do. I hid it from myself, too. I just found it. Because I couldn't get any at grocery pickup, you remember. So I thought, well, I'll just bring my jar. Amber won't care to eat after me because we've been friends since we were little. I'm like, she's not going to care. I couldn't remember where I put it. (laughs) So you still still haven't found it? No. (laughs) I found it. 
Well, I hid it from myself as soon as we got back from our trip, and I literally just found it before we started recording. Oh, my God. And I was like, that's the true crime right there. That is. I'm, like, already trying to figure out, like, when can we see each other again and have another, like, true crime-filled weekend together. This weekend. Just come on this weekend. I don't even care. Any weekend. Mi casa <laughs> es tu casa. I will come see you. I gotta figure it out. But anywho... You have been giving me these, like, little nuggets of hints and clues as to what you're covering this week, but I have no idea, so I'm real excited. I cannot believe you don't know this story. Now, okay, to be fair, when Amber did Scott Peterson, she hates Scott Peterson. She was over Scott Peterson. I do not hate these boys. I mean, the story is sad, don't get me wrong, but it's not like I just couldn't take any more of learning about this story. I just had a hard week personally, and so I was just not in the mood to go down this rabbit hole of sadness, you know? You do have to be in a certain mindset to do do anything true crime. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot going on, it's the last thing you want to do. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, and Amber knows this, and you guys probably don't, but Amber types out her stuff. I handwrite my stuff. <laughs> and I don't know how you do it, because I did that once, and my hand, I swear, looked like this. It was all cramped up for like a week. I can't. I, don't know how I you just do can't. It. I hated typing class in school. I would rather write. It just, that's how I roll. But that also does have consequences, obviously, because like you said, you'll get cramps and stuff, and you know. Mm-hmm. But I'm excited to tell it. So buckle up, Buttercup. <laughs> I'm buckled in. Let's do it. All right. Today, I'm covering a story that has intrigued me and much of the nation for a long time. And it's been on my to-do list for a while, which you know, because you've seen my to-do list. It has. Yes. This is because this is a case of parasite. The Oxford Dictionary defines parasite as the killing of a parent or other near relative. In this case, it is a killing of a father by his two young sons. And while this story is brutal, it is anything but cut and dry. It is filled with poverty, foster care, grooming, and abuse, and has really caused the world to look closer at why kids commit parasite as a whole. Today, I'm covering the murder of Terry King and the story of his sons, Alex and Derek King. So, you know right off the bat, when you say kids killing their father, you know I get Menendez Brothers vibes. Yeah, but but also these are kids kids, right? These are not adults. Yeah, these are kid kids and they lived in poverty, not wealthy okay, like so the Menendez brothers. Okay. So it's like brothers. the flip side. Yes. Okay. Yes, with a whole lot of messed up stuff in it. So Terry Lee King, which is the dad, he worked as a printer and Janet French, who worked as an exotic dancer, met in 1985 and were together for 8 years. They had two sons, Derek on May 4th, 1988 and Alex on July 12th, 1989. However, Terry and Janet weren't meant to be, and in 1993, when the boys were five and six, Janet left Terry. Janet changed her name to Kelly Marino and went on to have twin boys with someone else. On Terry's side of things, he struggled financially to support the boys alone, which I get. Like, that's tough. Oh, yeah. One kid is a lot, and then you have two. Mm Mm-hmm. And, I mean, they're both school age, so school supplies... And those are not cheap. Nope, I relate, Terry. (laughs) So Alex and Derek both went to stay with family for a while, but ultimately they both ended up in foster care. Mm. Derek was actually placed with the school principal, which I thought was kind of weird, but whatever. Okay. His name was Frank Lay, so Derek went to stay with Frank and his family while Alex remained in and out of state care. So, so far up to this point, these boys have really lived a life of uncertainty and no stability. And that's really hard on little kids because they don't understand how the world works. So all they know is like, nobody wants me. I'm getting tossed around to different places. Yeah. Those poor kids. Yeah. No, it, it was rough. I am sure. In 2001, Alex ended up moving back in with his dad, and shortly after Alex had moved back home, the Lay family said that they couldn't handle Derek's behavior either. So, Derek moved back in with his dad as well, which I don't really have answers as to how all that ended up happening because it's not like kids in foster care can just be like, I want to go home. And the state's like, right. okay, and that's it. Like, I would assume that Terry had to prove he was able to take care of them, but DSS files are sealed for a reason, so I didn't, I didn't go down that rabbit hole. Okay. Well, I'm glad you answered that because I was getting ready to ask. Like, yeah. wait a minute. Wait, How? what? That's what I okay. said. What? What? Yeah. I know. Also, too, like, if there's such thing as, like, voluntarily placing your children in foster care so you can get your crap together. I don't know. I don't know that much about foster care. If you know as a listener, let me know. 
but obviously the end goal with foster care is family reunification so if the story had ended here it would be great but obviously right it didn't. happy ending they all grew up and have family reunions every five years yeah. yeah yeah but it didn't go down that way soon after the boys moved back in terry didn't have electricity in the home so again i'm not sure how tss let these boys go back maybe he had power but ended up getting behind and it got turned off i'm not sure but he didn't he have knows. power he didn't have electricity okay so he's struggling still bless his mm -hmm. heart but also the boys said that Terry would occasionally hit them or like spank them or look at them wrong. But the boys say he wasn't really what you call abusive. Typical 80, early 90s parenting, like spanking. Like spare the rod, spoil the child. Yeah, but it wasn't okay. like he was like choking them or, you know, right. being ugly to them. Very stern. Probably like use the belt as a spanking kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and they never said a belt. They just said spanks or hit. So I assume like maybe with the flip flop. I don't know. Like, but he wasn't what they would consider abusive. So in their okay. mind, he was not. However, and that's a big however, whenever Terry was busy or unable to watch the boys for like work or whatever, he let a family friend, Rick Chavez, watch the boys. And I'm in the dark as to why this was ever considered by Terry. Because let me tell you about old Rick. Yeah, I need to learn about this uh, family. He's a family friend. Family friend. Okay, here we go. So, Rick lived in, it was like a trailer, but it was fenced in. It was like a compound filled with video games and computers. You know, stuff that kids really loved, especially at this time period. Yeah, yeah. Like AOL Messenger was just oh, I coming out. dial up now. Yep. <laughs> Spot on. It wasn't, but thanks. Do that a little bit longer and I was having PTSD. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, obviously things kids would like and probably not a grown man would be so into at this time. Yes. But Rick was a convicted child molester. Convicted. Convicted. In 1984, oh, Rick no. Chavez was convicted of sexually abusing two 13-year-old boys. So, like, what Why? the hell was Terry thinking? I don't know. I'd love to ask. Why would he send his boys over there? I don't, like, I don't want to be a victim shamer. Clearly, you know, Terry did not deserve to die. Maybe he had, like, exhausted all his resources the first time he fell down and out on his luck. Like, his family wouldn't help him with the boys. And if you can't afford power, you probably can't afford after-school daycare. I don't know. I'm not trying to judge. But what the hell, Terry? But literally, like, ask the neighborhood if you could, like, borrow their dog to watch the kids over this guy not a good choice in friends he was a no. family friend why would anybody i just i don't know we don't know we'll never know maybe that's rick was all he had i don't know but as a parent i cannot fathom it i can't mm -mm. but rick took a special interest in alex and started oh. having a sexual relationship with him okay and you remember alex is the youngest of the two yeah. He had been grooming the boys for some time, telling the boys to watch out for mental abuse from their father and buying them things such as TVs and had even encouraged them to run away. He would also smoke weed with them. Mm. These 12 and 13 at this time year old boys. I don't like this at all. No, he's a total asshole. I just, I hate him. He is the villain of the story in my opinion. Yeah. Alex said that Rick persuaded him to have a sexual relationship with him by confiding in Alex that he was gay, and he told Alex that no one else would be able to understand him. Which, nay nay, I say, being gay doesn't make you a pedophile! Uh, no. Ladder for those in the back. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an easy concept to grasp, and why people can't i just don't understand right over people's heads i don't know just putting that out there for those who need to hear it but it's important to remember that poor alex was 12 at this time i know he I know. was not old enough to give consent he was a fucking child a child with a messed up childhood who just wanted to be loved and Rick knew mm -hmm. all of this. Like, he had a front row seat as a family friend to all their misfortune. Right, and he took advantage of he that. He did. He used it to manipulate those boys. Mm. He had mind-fucked these boys so bad that in Alex's journal that was later found by police, Alex had written that he was in love with Rick. <gasps> no. 
for real. This 12-year-old boy had written that about a man who was 30 years older than him. Oh, my God. Like, and that poor little fellow really believed that because... That's all he knew. Yeah, that's what he knew, and he had been in and out, and he just wanted to be loved, and because this guy was showing him attention, even though it's like he was literally raping and molesting this kid, like, he believed him because he just wanted somebody to be there for him, and that, oh, God, special place in hell for you, Rick Chavez. Uh, yeah, he's got the VIP seat in hell, for sure. He does. Also, I cannot believe you're covering this story that you did the research on this because this is like me talking about a notorious animal abuser. This well, is like me covering Michael Vick right now. I just can't. But first off, Alex and Derek didn't die. We know that because I've already told you that. So I know, but they had to go through a lot of shit that you had to they read did. about. They did. And it was awful. But I felt like after you did Susan Cox Powell, I owed you a favor because that was a story that needed to be told and there's no way in hell I would have ever researched it because... <laughs> listening to it has given me nightmares okay Facts. Facts. so this is a thank you for that well it's not because it's sad and it's horrible <laughs> no 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 you keep it <laughs> <laughs> it's sad and it's horrible but i'm reaching to my deep dark place that i don't want to go because you did it for our podcast as well so here we are and you're welcome listeners yes we're here to ruin your day yet again. <laughs> and if you can't tell, I'm heated about it. And it's not just from this overheated room. It's true. Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Do you feel like you're stuck in a dinner rut? With HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-measured ingredients with mouthwatering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip all those trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. You can now enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in 30 minutes or less. With over 25 recipes to choose from each week, there is something for everyone to enjoy. All recipes are designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. I have not tried HelloFresh myself, but just looking on their website, the creamy lemon butter chicken looks amazing. Just click the link in our show notes and enter code HFAFF80, that's HFAFF80, to get $80 off, including free shipping. Go to the link in our show notes to get $80 off, including free shipping on HelloFresh, the number one meal kit. So on the evening of November 26th, 2001, this is like six months the boys had been back living with him not very long this is like thanksgiving time too yes it is i don't know what thanksgiving day was in 2001 but it's right around there terry lee king was bludgeoned to death by an aluminum baseball bat as he lay sleeping on the couch the house was then set on fire to get rid of evidence oh damn right yeah when firefighters responded to the fire at terry's Gatonement, florida home they found terry dead from blunt force trauma and on November 27th, the police picked up Alex and Derek from Rick's house and took them in for questioning, where the boys both immediately confessed to killing their father. They were each charged with one count of murder and sent to a juvenile center until trial. So they immediately confessed. They did. They did. And in their original, original, keyword original, confession, Derek and Alex said that Alex was the one who suggested they kill their dad, and Derek was the one who did the beating, while Alex stood by and encouraged him to keep hitting Terry so he wouldn't wake up and see them. Oh my god. They were embarrassed. Oh. That's rough. That's some hardcore conflict right there. It is. And they said that he was, like, making a noise, like he was snoring and stuff. I mean, it was just, it was sad. Mm. Stupid-ass Rick Chavez was also charged with accessory to murder because he did hide the boys at his home and supposedly wash blood from their clothes. Mm-hmm. I had a feeling. Mm-hmm. And so this is where things start getting messy and confusing. So like I said, originally, 12- and 13-year-old Alex and Derek originally confessed that they killed their dad. But then they added the detail that Rick had convinced them to kill Terry. Which, I mean, Ooh, I was wondering if that was going to happen. Straight up, I believe that. But mm -hmm. then they came out and said Rick snuck into their house, woke the boys up, told them to be quiet and go wait in his car. So they did. Then later, Rick came out of the King house and drove the boys to his house and told the boys that he killed their father. During trial, Alex said, quote, 
He said that he'd done it for us and that our dad would have killed us before he let us go live with him, end quote. Derek told jurors the same exact story. Now, these boys were not incarcerated together. Okay, so they didn't have time to make up oh. a story. Like, and it was the next day after they killed their dads, you know, or the dad was killed. So, so just to clarify, so now they're saying that Rick killed was their the one dad. that did it? Yep. And then, like, told them to confess because obviously they're kids, you know. Right. Okay. And so then Derek, he was asked about his relationship with his dad during trial. And bless his heart. I'm going to read it just like he said it. And mm -hmm. you can tell he was really struggling. He said, quote, I did like it with him when when I was there with him and around him, but he he said he'd make it better and that he'd like he'd he'd he would help us and like make it better and give us stuff like get a TV and stuff like that, but he didn't have a chance to. And then Derek started sobbing and asked the judge for a break. Hmm. So like I wasn't stuttering. I'm not making fun of Derek King. Like, that's his exact statement as it was recorded. Like, he was struggling to get through that. Oh and, like, God. the fact that he said he didn't get a chance to, that just, mm, I was tore up about that. Yeah. And so what's really unusual here is that the prosecution decided to try Chavez and the King boys for the same crime at the same time. Wow. But not like all together. It wasn't like Rick Chavez was having these charges and the King boys had their charges. It wasn't like all three at the same. Right. But the boys had them together. Yes. Okay. But at the same time, it was all going on at the same time, which is just weird. And so when Rick Chavez was in court, they withheld announcing what if he was found guilty or not until after the King brothers trial. Wow. I guess because okay. it would influence that never happens. it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just... <laughs> wild i've never it's heard bizarre. of that yeah me neither so rather fucking unfortunately rick chavez was acquitted for murder which look i don't know maybe he didn't murder anybody but he definitely had a part in that so anyways he was acquitted I don't know how to feel about that i don't either but stay with me because there's more okay. charges for him and okay good on september 6th 2002 both boys were convicted of second degree murder but the judge threw the conviction out because he believed Alex and Derek's right to due process was violated. The prosecution and defense did not want to have to, like, start a whole new trial. Mm -hmm. So they settled in mediation. And in November of 2002, both Alex and Derek pled guilty to third-degree murder. Derek was sentenced to eight years in prison, and Alex was sentenced to seven years. And what was really sad was that they seemed not to grasp... Like, when they were not being questioned or even after their verdicts and their sentencing and stuff was read, mm -hmm. they didn't grasp what this meant. Their mom, Kelly, said that they legit thought they were going to get to go to the playground after this was over and play with other kids. Oh, my God. Like, jurors and people in the courtroom all observed that they were very childlike because, gee, they're kids. They and are people kids. are like, well, I don't know. Maybe, oh, Ricky Chavez could have convinced them because they're kids and they seem naive or... Well, no shit, dipshit. Like, they're kids. Well, you got to think, though, that was back... I mean, we say 2001, 2002 was not that long ago, but it kind of was. But it was, it was a different time. Like, kids nowadays grow up so fast. Mm -hmm. Just look at TikTok for five seconds. Oh, I know. So, putting myself back in that time, that's understandable that they would be a lot younger than, like, a 12 or 13-year-old today. Right. Like, this... What would I have been doing at 12 or 13 is what I thought. And exactly. I wouldn't have... And we were kids. Yeah. Yeah. We were kids. So that's just sad to me, though. Also, it should be mentioned that Ricky Chavez stood trial for child molestation in a separate trial, but was acquitted, which that Why? is 1,000% bogus ass bullshit. Why was he acquitted? Beyond me, friend. Oh my God. Just when I'm, like, starting to find a little glimmer of hope that, you know, the court system works properly this shit happens and then i'm like why <laughs> yeah but rick chavez is still serving his 35 years for his accessory charge in tampering with evidence and account for false imprisonment for keeping alex i don't know like it didn't really explain that part of it i don't know hmm. does it make sense because okay. derek was obviously there too but whatever okay. he is set for release in 2033 I hope that scumbag never gets out. I hope he dies in prison. Honestly, yes. <laughs> Honestly, he's probably serving more time for these other charges than he would have ever for child molestation. Because child molesters don't really get that long in prison. 
And maybe that's why he was acquitted, because they do that sometimes. Yeah, if there's, perhaps, like, multiple but... charges going on, if there's, like, a lesser one that they know doesn't really matter, then they kind of just leave it to the wayside. Perhaps. But I wish they would given him, like, an additional 10 years, 15, 20, like, for yeah. abusing and manipulating these poor kids. If only. If only. But they didn't. I don't know. Maybe he'll be an unexemplary prisoner and rack up some more prison time. Be bad in there, Rick Chavez. Be bad. Or just get shanked. Get shanked by someone. Let Rick your Chavez guard down. is going to get out of prison and come kill us. So come for me, bro. <laughs> yeah, I just really like, I cannot stand a fucking child molester. As particularly this one in this moment. Dude, give me the chance to get in a ring with this asshole. I'm telling I'd you, boy. To. Yes. That's a fight I'd watch. So... When all was said and done, Alex King was released from prison at 18 on April 9th, 2008, after serving six years, and Derek King was released on March 7th, 2009, after seven years. In 2005, when Alex was 15, he was charged with attempting to escape from the juvenile prison he was at. Okay. But he talks about how that was actually a really big wake-up call for him that, like, he wanted out of prison and so he needed to, like, straighten up and fly right and, like, get right with the Lord and do what he needed to do if he was going to get out and be a productive member of society. So, no other incidents in prison except that one, I think he said they put pillows on the bed. And now, look, him and his brother were not incarcerated together, so I guess his cellmate. But they put, like, pillows on the bed and covered him up just like you would at 15 to sneak out the window. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and please tell me that he, like, tied together a bunch of bed sheets to, like, <laughs> sneak out a window and, like, crawl down the side wall. I hope he did. That is some 15-year-old shit yes, right off is. gate. Yes, it is. Like, say what you want, but that's that's 15-year-old shit. What a brave little toaster. <sighs> If you don't name this episode Brave Little Toaster. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, like I said, a really high profile case and tons of people's hearts just went out to these boys. Lots of people donated money to the boys and their defense funds. Oh, wow. Yeah. And in 2003, Lisa Drew Alton, along with several others, started the King Brothers Trust Fund. So that when they got out, they'd have some money to start their lives. Obviously, that's a huge part of getting out of prison. Like, it's hard to find jobs. You don't have yeah, money. Yeah, like, what do you do? Where and do you obviously, go? the King's brother, their, their dad's dead. Like, so who's going to help them? You know? So I thought that was really great. And then through Lisa Alton, they met Dan Daly, who was a widower. And he sent the boys books while they were incarcerated and wrote them. He also donated $100 to their fund, just like on a whim. And then he started mm -hmm. sending them books. I love that. I love that too. You go, Dan Daly. Kathy Medico wrote a book about the boys and she genuinely cared for them. Like she got to meet them and she, you know, mm -hmm. she just felt very maternal towards them because they didn't really have a parent. Their mom had gone long ago. Obviously, yeah. it sounds like their mom stood up for them in court and tried to do the right thing. But let me tell you, somebody was like, well, if you would have paid more attention to them when they were in their playpens, they wouldn't be here. I'm like, why yeah. are you going to mom shame? Like, when they were in playpens, she was there. <laughs> you know more than anybody being a mom yourself that like, literally that is the worst community is other yes. parents. Because yep. you talk about some judgmental creatures. It's bad. Yeah, bad out there. So I'm not surprised. No. I'm not. But Kelly Medico, like I said, she generally cared for them. So she became like a second mom to them. And actually, Alex started calling her mom or mother. So I'm not sure really how Kelly felt about that. But Kathy kind of stepped in, you know. Well, I'm glad somebody did. Yeah. Rosie O'Donnell, like the actress. Mm -hmm. She is obviously, I think a lot of people know she's a foster mom herself. Yes. And she also helped the King boys by getting a high-profile criminal attorney, Jane Weintraub, to assist in trying to get the boys a new trial, which they ended up not needing one because they did, like, mediation and stuff. But mm -hmm. um, she did try to help, which I thought was pretty cool. Like, that's how high-profile cool. it was, though, that, like, actors and actresses were getting involved to try to help. But then, the real winner of this story, okay, Mr. Dan Daly, the man who had sent the boys books while they were incarcerated, he created a West Texas sanctuary called Estrella Vista. It's in the middle of nowhere. And when I say it's in the middle of nowhere, it doesn't even show up on Google Maps. Like, out there. 
Estrella Vista is home to Dan, Alex, and two other parasites, Nathan Yabanez and Lone Heron. Dan also started an advocacy organization called the Redemption Project that's aimed to helping parasites. It hires lawyers and provides mentorships and financial assistance for these kids once they're released. And Dan hopes that eventually the 13 or 14 other parasites he advocates for can come and enjoy this sanctuary if they're released. And he's actually made Alex and Nathan and Lone, I want to say let's like shareholders or something like they're mm -hmm. like, so if they needed to sell it or whatever after Dan dies to, you know, continue the advocacy or whatever they can. Oh, okay. And if the other 13 or 14 get released and they can come there, they would also be put on there as well so that the money would be split. It. So, like, he's really here for these kids. He's really, like, investing in their future. He is. Derek and Alex King have seen each other since their release, and Alex was involved in a hit-and-run accident and fled on foot. He served some small time for that, not very much, so I guess the person was okay. Didn't mm -hmm. say, but I assume he or she was okay, because otherwise he would not have served very little time. But otherwise, finding work has been difficult because of their record, obviously, and who they are. Everybody knows who they are. Mm -hmm. But they are out in the world being productive members of society, working, trying to help others. Parasite is a really complex thing, and the research that has been done on it shows that it's usually one of two things. Either severe mental health issues or a child trying to escape or protect themselves or like a sibling or someone else like that in uh -huh. an abusive situation. So it's usually one or two things. Like really, you're messed up, you are not getting help for it. Like mentally, you're having trouble. Maybe you hear voices telling you to commit a crime. Not that you necessarily want to, or you're trying to protect yourself or get out of something abusive. So it's not really like cold-blooded and- It's not very cut and dry. It's not- It's just not. Pure- Like just hatred for no reason, except for <laughs> the Menendez brothers. But- um, <laughs> Well, they were adults. So, I feel like they're in their own category. They are. They are. Hopefully, this will continue to be studied so we can learn more and try to better prevent parasites in the future, get these kids out before things like this happen, provide more resources, do some more Dan Daly shit out here in the world. The King Brothers have done interviews that are easily accessible on YouTube, and I'll have Amber link the one that I'm going to talk about was from. But I want to leave you guys with what Alex King said during an interview with Larry King. Alex said that he misses his dad sometimes, especially in his successes, and he thinks his dad would be proud of him. Hmm. Which is so sad. It is. And that, my friends, is the sad and twisty story of Alex and Derek King and the murder of their father, Terry King. So, obviously they were children when all this happened, but have they ever said any sort of clear cut why they did it? No, I mean, pretty much, you know, the manipulation and abuse from Rick. And also, you know, they're just in a really bad, impoverished situation. And like Rick told them that, you know, if their dad were out of the way, they could live there where there's electricity, you know. And I don't know. I don't know that Rick Chavez didn't do it. I don't know if the boys did it. Obviously, they pled guilty to it. And they've said, like, it was a horrible thing. And they have said that when they look back at, like, TV footage or they try to think back about when this happened, it's almost like it's a different person. And I get that mm -hmm. because I didn't kill my parents. But who I was at 12 or 13 is a stark difference from who I am. Yeah. At yeah, 33. Sure. Like, that's that feels like a different lifetime ago. So. Oh, Yeah. I think it's really hard for them to say what their 12 or 13 year old selves were feeling or why they did this other than obviously they were manipulated, abused, had had a rough childhood. Well, and like I said, when you're a kid, you don't grasp mm -mm. what reality is and the severity of any even small choice that you make. Right. Like you just don't yeah. understand how the real world works. No, you don't. So I can't even imagine. I just didn't know if like later on they had said, yeah, Rick had us fucked up. Like we were thinking in a fairy tale land and just I don't know if they yeah, said no, I mean, that, that, they said. definitely said like well he offered us a TV and a place to stay and said that our okay. lives would be better if we lived with him but that's really the only thing okay 
but at 12 or 13, like you said, you don't understand the gravity mm-hmm. of consequences no. of your actions. So, and especially like if you don't have electricity, then you probably don't have hot water. Like who knows right. what the food situation was like that. And somebody promising you electricity and a hot shower and video games mm-hmm. and, you know, safety. Yeah. And obviously Alex was so far manipulated by Rick that he thought he loved this man. Yeah, that's the part that just ugh, stuck a knife in my gut and twist it. Like, that's the really messed up part. It is. So, I mean, that's that's why. And it's unfortunate and they have said they wish they hadn't, you know, but you can't go back in time and undo the shit you did at 12 or 13. Trust me, I would love if I could, even <laughs> just for me, but... Right. But you learn and you grow, and I'm really glad that they had the opportunity to be out in the world and try to live some form of a normal life as best you can after you've been through something like that. And I hope nothing but the best and wish them all the success. And I hope they really can help other parasite people as well. Like, you can't prevent a lot of murders and a lot of stuff because some of them are, you know, in the heat of the moment crimes right. of passion, serial killers. You can't, that's not something necessarily that you can see coming. But this, you can prevent. This could have 100% been prevented. It could have been. Love our podcast? Then hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. We're also on Patreon. Head on over to patreon.com slash truecrimebuzz and join today for access to all our exclusive content, including bonus episodes. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TC Buzz Podcast. And check out our website at www.truecrimebuzz.com. Until next time, cheers! cheers.